Hello and welcome to the In Publishing podcast. I'm Kia Byrne and my guest this week is Paul McNamee, UK editor of The Big Issue. I talked to Paul about his journey to editing The Big Issue via the music press, what it's like producing a national magazine out of Glasgow and the secrets of being an award-winning editor. Well, the first thing, obviously, is the people around you. You know, you cannot do all of this on your own. It takes time to allow your ego to accept that you're <laughs> you're not going to be able to do all this on your own and to make some mistakes. And I've been lucky to have John Bird as my boss and proprietor, who has never really interfered in where the editorial has gone. He and I talk quite frequently about it and we plan different things, but he won't ring and say, look, you, I want this and I want that. And it just doesn't happen like that. And what he also does is he's allowed me to make a certain number of mistakes. Paul told me about the public perception of the big issue versus the reality and the challenges the magazine has faced during the pandemic. How to many, it is simply the homeless magazine. And the the truth and reality is this, regardless of how I have changed the editorial, how I've changed the look and changed the team, and regardless of the awards, not just for me, but for the magazine, people, I think, to an extent, still think of it as the homeless magazine. How he would describe the big issue to someone who's never read it. To describe it to somebody that doesn't know it, I would say that it is a a challenging, provocative, outsider title that is sold by the homeless and marginalised people of Britain. The tremendous success the magazine has enjoyed since it was launched by John Bird and Gordon Roddick in 1991. We've been around for nearly 30 years, but in that time in Britain we've sold, we reckon, somewhere around 210 million copies of the magazine, enough to stretch from Earth to the International Space Station and then a bit further. And how, for the first time, the magazine has turned to subscriptions in the face of lockdowns and that it now needs all the help it can get. We need to be there for vendors who, when the winter hits, have nothing. And we need to be there post-December when things are lean in, in the spring. So the next number of weeks, I will not try and sugarcoat it, are going to be really, really hard. And it's a tough time and it, and it, it takes it out of you. But then, when I think that, then I just think, well, you're not out selling it, so dry your eyes and get on that. We would like to thank our podcast sponsor, Acorn Web Offset, the Yorkshire-based specialist A5 and A4 magazine printer. With high-speed web offset and sheet-fed printing, together with in-house saddle stitching, perfect binding and mailing services, Acorn can cope with the most demanding of production turnarounds. Acorn prides itself on its efficiency and low-cost print production. For more information, visit acornweb.co.uk. Paul McNamee has been UK editor of The Big Issue since 2011, managing the title across all of its national and regional editions as well as online. Based in Glasgow, He has been named Editor of the Year three times by PPA Scotland and he's twice been named British Editor of the Year by the British Society of Magazine Editors. Paul, welcome to the In Publishing podcast. Thank you very much. So can I begin by asking whether you always wanted to be a journalist and how you got into journalism? Uh, I did always want to be a journalist. In fact, it's a question that that my daughter, who is currently choosing her um, university course keeps asking because she complains she doesn't know what she's going to be uh, and I ve- from really really early decided I want to be a journalist it was mostly to be a football writer I thought I, I read we, the Daily Mirror was the paper that came into the house my dad read the Daily Mirror and I when I grabbed it often when I could and I read all the football reporters and people like Tony Stenson and these kind of names um Lit up my youth, and I thought if I could find a way to get the football, write about it, and get paid for it, that would be the way forward. And then, as I got a little older, the the romance of journalism, as it was, <laughs> still still applied, and I had this notion of being one of those guys who um, gets sent out by his editor to bring back the story and does everything they can to get it. Um, so th- that was fairly hard baked early. Um, and the, the route to it was, was a little less straightforward. So, so tell us about that. What, how did you get your break? Well, I, I, I didn't come from any particular um, 
background that would open any doors. My um, my my dad was a a barman, sometimes on the on the brew, so it wasn't always straightforward at home. And then my mum was a, a hairdresser and hospital cleaner, so they didn't really know anybody who could give me a a start. And uh, like a lot of Northern Irish people of my generation, that became quite a thing to use education to get you out of the situation you're in. So I, I followed that, even though I, it, it, with hindsight, probably trying to do exams and get to university wasn't necessarily the best route. But in any event, I did. And it was after university. I studied French at university. And afterwards, I started working for a, a little free sheet in North Belfast because I just needed to find something somewhere. And it was advertised and it was around the mid nineties. And it was at a time when there was some peace dividend money coming through. And to be honest, I was the, the Catholic employee who could fulfill the need they had to say, well, we've got a certain number of people from both communities as they're so-called in Northern Ireland. And I got to start there writing about all sorts of things within that local area. It was just a little free sheet. And it was clear that that wasn't going to really go anywhere. I needed to get a qualification. Couldn't afford to pay for the postgrad. So I got them to agree to pay for the postgrad if I still did day release with them and, and help them out, which is what I did for a while. But then eventually I, that kind of lapsed. <laughs> and um, I started working in the Fermanagh Herald and then a Skillen while I was still in Belfast. And that was really how I got started. And, and then you got into music journalism, is that right? Yes, uh, it had always been what I uh, I wanted to do. I remember there was one day that, that going down to um, Fermanagh, I, I still was football obsessive, but as I'd grown up, I had become much more uh, hooked by music. So they were the two, they were the twin towers of um, my youth. Um, and I remember getting the bus because I had to take a bus from Belfast down to Skillen every day to go to do the shifts down there. And it was 90 minutes each way on a bus. And I was coming out one Thursday evening. I think the paper had just been put to bed. And I was reading the NME. And I'd always read the NME. And I'd always wanted to work for the NME. And I got so exasperated by a a report in the NME about placebo. I don't remember the band placebo. I thought, what are you writing writing about them for? Why are you writing so badly? I could do this so much better. And it was then... I, it, rather than just have this kind of pipe dream of working in the music press, I thought, right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to show them. So by a couple of um, steps, Colin Murray and I, Colin, who's now a very successful broadcaster, really brilliant, brilliant broadcaster, we're friends. Uh, and while I was working with Fermanagh Herald, I was also working bar at night to make up, to make ends meet, and he was DJing. And we struck upon this idea of launching a music magazine in Northern Ireland that would... Um, sock it to them all. It would show them the the reality and what can be done. And it was around 96 when there was a sense of hope and change in Northern Ireland. And again, we had no money, so we we did everything we could. We went to the Prince's Trust and we did all the hands across the barricade. Colin came from working class Protestant background. I came from working class Catholic. So we said this was a great idea of unity. We played all the cards. We went to get funding wherever we could and we set up a magazine. And then we brought people in and we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we really didn't, but we learned very quickly in the job and we learned about assembling magazines. We learned about working with printers. We learned about uh, trying to sell ads, which we were really hopeless at. We learned just any, anything that was connected to the business in a very short space of time. And so how did you get from there to the big issue? <laughs> I'll, I, well, I'll, I'll accelerate that. I, okay. I, I, I went from... Blank didn't last very long because we just didn't know what we were doing. We ran up debts. Another publisher said, well, look, I'll buy you two, as in us two, not the band, uh, Colin and I, if you come in and do some stuff to this magazine, I'll take your debt. So he took the debt. We went in, but then Colin and I kind of part of company. I ended up at the NME for a number of years. Then I was freelancing, doing a whole set of different things and different papers, just building up experience and knowledge and contacts and all those kind of things. And I was in London for a good number of years around that time. And it happened that the big issue in Scotland were looking to change things a bit. And a particular title I'd been working on, I'd been editing another magazine in Ireland, uh, post-NME. 
and the chief exec had seen it and said, look, I, I like some of the things you're doing. Do you want to come over and try some things here? Um, and I've always gone with the workers being Irish. We just follow it. Uh, and it helped also that my wife is Scottish and it gave us an opportunity to move to Glasgow at that time. Um, so that was around 2007-ish. I went over as deputy editor initially in the big issue in Scotland. And at that time, unlike now, all the regional editions were segmented. So there was a an edition for Scotland that had its own editorial team, its own sales team, its own print slots, all everything separate. Likewise in Wales, likewise in England, likewise even in the southwest of England. So there are all these different editions. Um, and I, I started to work, then I became editor in Scotland. And then for various reasons, editor across Scotland and Wales. And then at, at a point when the industry, I think, was changing, and it became very clear that producing content like that was, you know, it was counterproductive because, A, you were going for the same editorial targets and B more pertinently you were going for the same advertising targets um, and so the company said look we, we need to do this better and at that point they put together a core editorial team I became editor of the UK I did out of and still do out of Glasgow I'm very proudly that we're able to produce a national magazine out of Glasgow but what that means is we have a core team here and until lockdown <laughs> We produced four different editions every week. They wouldn't have a great deal of change in them, but there'd be slip page changes, ad page changes, some news pages. So there was a percentage of them that were different. Um, and, and that's how that happened. And are there still um, teams elsewhere in the UK or is it is it all done from Glasgow now? The majority of the editorial team is here in Glasgow. We have the... I have got a couple of um, journalists who are based out of the London office and then there are freelancers a little more than freelancers core contributors let's call them uh, in different parts of the country there isn't an editorial office maintained in different parts of the office the one in London um, are, are, are based there in North London it also looks after it's a home for Big Issue Invest for Big Issue Foundation different parts of the company foundations the charitable arm um yeah. and a lot of the back office stuff so we don't keep core teams no but i do have key members of the team in different parts of the country so as i said in the introduction you've been named editor of the year three times by ppa scotland and twice by the bsme what is your secret to being a great editor <laughs> i don't know i'm a great editor uh i <laughs> uh it's very kind of you to say that i well, the first thing, obviously, is the people around you. You know, you cannot do all of this on your own. So I think when you, it takes time to allow your ego to accept that you're <laughs> you're not going to be able to do all this on your own and to make some mistakes. And I've been lucky to have John Bird as my boss and proprietor who has never really interfered in where the editorial has gone. He and I talk quite frequently about it and we plan different things but he will not he won't ring and say look you i want this and i want that and it just doesn't happen like that and what he also does is he's allowed me to make a certain number of mistakes and some of the early magazines that i was looking after i look back and think what was i thinking what you know why was that cover there why did i have that contributor although frankly i do that most weeks anyway but um he he allowed me to to make mistakes and to grow and to learn as an editor on top of that, then you start to build a team who can deliver the things that you want delivered and also bring different perspective because you're not going to have it all yourself. And and if you are smart enough, you will bring in people who will um, come with a different point of view and present really well and have different contacts than you have. So you you begin to, to grow out from there. You know that I... I particularly think that the relationship between an editor, a deputy editor, and the art director, that triumvirate is, is really, really key to producing a great title, whether it's in, in paper or online. Um, so it, it's building a team, trusting the team, allowing yourself 
to know when things are wrong, allowing yourself to make decisions and be able to change those decisions and listen to others. I, I've, I've been lucky that there have been certain people through my career who I've been able to learn from at different times. Um, Colin Murray, I'd say, first and early because he he was just a real risk taker. And when we were coming up with ideas initially and blanks, you know, the, the blank was the name of the magazine, incidentally, that we started in in Belfast. Some of the ideas were ludicrous, you know, and we thought, well, how, how can these work? But it, once you start to work them through, you think, yeah, yeah, that does work. So a certain amount of risk taking that I took from him. When I went to the NME, there were people like Ted Kessler, uh, James Oldham, who were just, uh, and Conor McNicholas as well. He he was, I think, a really undervalued but really really smart editor. So I I'd watch how they they um, they worked. I'd I'd learn from them, and then also I think later on, John Bird to a, a huge degree, and I, I, and also Barry Michael Henney has been a great. Uh, help and, and influence and, and, and guide to me through the later part of my career. So how would you describe the big issue to someone who's never heard of the magazine, which is unlikely because most people have heard of it, but perhaps they've spent the last 30 years living as a hermit? <laughs> well, I'd, you know, sadly here, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine that there are a lot of people who, who haven't heard of it. And every week it, it's part of my job is to make more and more people um, know what the big issue is and what it's for and how to respond to it. I think <clears throat> there's two things with the big issue. One is how we want to present it, and one is how the public see it. And the, the truth and reality is this. Regardless of how I have changed the editorial and how I've changed the look and changed the team, and regardless of the awards, not just for me, but for the magazine, for the design, for the writers, regardless of all that, people, I think, to an extent, still think of it as the homeless magazine and what you're doing then is you're you have to work out well is that is that a positive or is that a negative is that good that it's got such brand awareness across britain or is it bad that you have to start explaining well no it's, that's not quite what it is so i think to describe it to somebody that doesn't know it i would say that it is a a challenging provocative outsider title that is sold by the homeless and marginalized people of Britain and, and beyond. And then it allows me to go into talk about its, its global reach. Because I think a lot of people have a, a really key relationship with the individual vendors. You know, if they, and, and just in case any listeners aren't aware, the, the way it works is the people, the marginalized, the homeless and the people at risk of homelessness, they come to the big issue um, and they buy the big issue from us for half the cover price. Then they go out and sell it. That's how they make their living. And we, we've been around for nearly 30 years. Obviously, not all of them that I've been here. But in that time in Britain, we've sold, we reckon, somewhere around 210 million copies of the magazine. Enough to stretch wow. from Earth to the International Space Station and then a bit further. It's a lot. And that if you think about that, Think about the money that that means has gone into the pockets of those most marginalised people who otherwise wouldn't be able to make that money or indeed who would be calling on the Chancellor of the Exchequer to give them money. So we're, we're this, and we're not a charity. We are a business, a social business. Um, so that, that's one of the first things to, to reiterate. That's, how, that's our business model. What we have in the magazine, I would like to think, is when I, when I took over, one thing I wanted to make sure was people weren't, buying just as a petty purchase that they didn't think well i'll give this this man or woman some money and then i'll take my magazine and throw it back in my car throw it at the bottom of a bag and never look at it i want them to value the product as much as they value the interaction with the person they're buying it from so that the content has to be something that drives as many sales as the social benefit of buying from a homeless person and i've worked incredibly hard to make that make that the case so it, because we are not owned by a, a a media company because we don't have a particular agenda to work to we can then be more nimble and more of an outsider well we're still a big title you know we sell 
until lockdown, we sold a lot of magazines every week. But we're still the organisation, we're still the magazine that gives voice to those who don't have voice. And I'm very proud of that. That we will, If somebody comes to us and says, look, I've got this problem with a landlord, we'll look into it and we'll advocate on their behalf. Or if it is a whole set of people who are um, facing a particular problem, we will advocate on their behalf. And we'll go further than that. You know, we'll, we'll talk in, in, we'll go into Parliament now. John Bird is a peer, so he has got a, the ear of certain people and he can try and get bills through and we can look to, to advocate for people in ways we haven't before. So the big issue as a magazine has grown from this one particular thing to become a brand that does vast amount more. I'm not sure that's answered your question. I think I went off on some of the times in there. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you say that it's very important to you that um, it's not just a pity purchase and that, that people are buying it for the editorial. Um, but given that um, you can be bought by a very wide range of people, yeah. um, how do you then decide on your editorial mix? Well, this, this, this is an ongoing and interesting question. And I, I'll, I'll try and answer it succinctly. But what, one thing that I, I try and do when I have either new people in or I'm doing presentations or wherever, I say that any title tends to sell within its silo. If it is Empire magazine, it will know the certain type of demographic. If you like a certain type of film, they will produce a really brilliant magazine and a podcast and all the associated things, knowing that demographic. Or if it's a, a, a woman's magazine or a gardening magazine, uh, as you will know well, the, you know, it will be a particular sort of person and you'll, you'll write to that. And correctly, you say, we can't, we can't do that. We have to sell to all. So what I like to look at is rather in vertical silos, I look at a horizontal line. And on that horizontal line, <clears throat> regardless of age, regardless of social class, regardless of ethnicity or any of those things, the reason you're coming to the big issue, I hope, or the content that we want to introduce you to is a base interesting people saying interesting things. But beyond that, you have perhaps something of a social justice fire burning in you. You want to, you want to know something about the world. You want to feel as though you're making the world better either by your purchase or by the thing you're reading in there. So it's not necessarily strictly a demographic, it's a mindset. And what I'm trying to do is get through to a particular mindset. And if you're a 13 year old kid who's just becoming alive to the politics around you or the injustice around you, or if you're uh, an 80 year old retiree who still has a burning desire to change the world for a better place, but you, you, want, you want your title to do that for you, that's, that's where we are. And then if you start from there and you think, how do we produce content that speaks to that rather than to a single person? Then you begin to look where your content fills in behind it. I also make sure, I, well, I try, <laughs> I try to make sure that we have a wit to us. I don't want to feel preachy because I think if you start preaching to people and making it look as though you have come down the mountain and you've got the holy tablets and they should read them. Nobody wants that. I certainly don't want that. So we have to write with wit. We have to write engagingly we have to write with a certain fearlessness i want all that to come through so again that fits with this horizontal line that our readers are, are sitting on and can you tell us about what have been some of your best selling issues and what makes a winning issue and a winning cover well i, 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 I let's talk about a few of them um there are over the years a, a vendors will tell me when I go into, when I go out anywhere, I'll go and buy the magazine, and I'll just ask the vendors what it's like. And most of them, of course, don't know me. Why would they? Some of them do, but I, I do ask what they like about the magazine and what they they don't like. And I remember a vendor once said, "Just stick the Muppets or Doctor Who on the cover and stop messing around." And I thought that that will get very old very quickly. <laughs> um, but certainly over the past, when we've put Doctor Who on the cover. That, that works. And that speaks to the level of access that the big issue gets. Because of its reputation and because when we go into an interview, we're not trying to... I'm a news journalist, so I know how to get a line out of somebody, but that's not what the, the big issue is trying to do. The big issue is trying to 
present a platform where the person we're interviewing can give us something that they're not necessarily going to give somewhere else. It's why our Letter to My Younger Self feature works so brilliantly every week. It's a reveal. In terms of covers, recently and over the last number of years, Street Cat Bob has been a gold mine for us. Um, I'm not sure of if you or your listeners would be aware, Street Cat Bob is the, the street cat who became hugely famous because of his story. Um, James Bowen was his, uh, his owner, and he was discovered. James at that time was selling the magazine and also busking a bit in Common Garden. And a publisher said, oh, there's, there's a story here because the cat stayed on his shoulders, followed him around. It had a, there was a strange relationship between them. Uh, and so a book came. And the book detailed how the street cat had helped James overcome heroin addiction. Um, the big issue had also helped him because it provided income. And it was this lovely tale. And out of that, this incredible international following developed. And other books came, kids' versions of books, books in other languages. Then there was a film. Then more books. And there's just been another film, a sequel, that uh, has, has come out very recently. And each time there was something involved with the cat, because people associated with the big issue, if I put the cat in the cover, massive seals, massive overseas seals. So while it's not going to win you a Pulitzer Prize putting the cat on the cover, it works well for the big issue, and that's really important. The covers are very important for the big issue, for our vendors. I've got a 20-foot rule. If it doesn't work at 20 feet, it doesn't work as a cover. It doesn't have to be a prize-winning cover every time. It just has to be the right cover for the big issue. So that works. Also what works are guest editors. Um, to a, a huge degree. And again, it's because people trust us and because I guess there's something of a halo effect if you're involved with a big issue. Now and again, I like to work with different people who can bring a different perspective and essentially author an edition. And whenever we do that, several things happen. One, they bring people and ideas that we wouldn't necessarily have every week. And two, they open it out to different parts of the world that we wouldn't necessarily. And sometimes it just goes absolutely crazy. And I'll give you three examples, if I may, um, of, in recent times. One of them, we had Armando Iannucci, the, the, the brilliant genius comic writer, director, performer. And he guest edited, <clears throat> excuse me, the magazine, which was a thrill to have him involved. And we talked and talked about what might be the, the thing that would be the real hook in it. And he said, well, how about... Um, we have Malcolm Tucker in conversation with Alan Partridge. And I thought, holy smokes. <laughs> yes, that would do. Uh, and Malcolm Tucker, his, his creation from the thick of it, the, the sweary spin doctor, had essentially been retired since the thick of it stopped. So this was a big thing. And to have him in this conversation uh, with, with uh, Alan Partridge, that was, you know, that was just wow. And that went everywhere, as you might expect. And, that helped boost the sales of the magazine and it helped the vendors. And it's one of those very happy moments when you know that this is just going to go. Equally, <clears throat> recently, just over a year ago, in fact, um, we had Floella Benjamin uh, from, uh, as some listeners may know, was the, the host of, of Play School and is now a very yes. uh, long serving peer. Uh, an advocate for black rights, uh, particularly around Windrush. And it was coming up the anniversary of Windrush, so we asked if Luella would guest edit a, a Windrush special. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I wanted it to be a celebration of the successes of the people who were of the Windrush generation because we knew of the, the injustice that the British government had perpetrated on so many people. And we, we did some of that as well in the magazine, but it turned out to be this wonderful, rich, deep, representation of parts of British life that you don't always see or if you do it's maybe one or two bits and to have that as a film magazine it was just wonderful and that also sold well and finally just one one final one that, because this is always a, one that I, I, I just is, it is a kind of illustration of how the big issue can take you to some very strange places Mark Miller the comic book writer the hugely successful comic book writer has recently sold his Miller World franchise to Netflix um, I know Mark, and I asked him if he wanted to guest edit the magazine, and he came on with the theme of heroes. And his idea was to ask various people he knew, 
in the world of entertainment and film and so forth, who their heroes were, if they'd like to interview them or write about them. And we got such a load of really brilliant people in. But one in particular, he said, look, I, I've got Mark Hamill. And I said, do you mean Mark Hamill's and Luke Skywalker? He said, yeah, yeah, Mark Hamill. And I said, right, okay, good. And he said, and Mark Hamill's great heroes are the kinks, and, which is not what I expected. And no. I said, okay, good, good. And he said, he wants to interview Ray Davis. And I thought, right, Ray Davis, you know, he can be tricky enough to get, but we'll see what we can do. And we set it up. Uh, but then when Dave Davis, Ray Davis' brother, the other driving force behind the kinks, heard about this, he said, well, I want to be interviewed as well. And so I had this weird situation where Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, rang me up. I was standing in my kitchen and he rang and he said, Hi, Paul, it's, it's Mark. I need to ask you some advice. I've got, I'm going to do Ray, but Dave wants to do it as well. How should I do it? And I thought in that moment, here I am standing in my kitchen in Glasgow. Luke Skywalker is asking me for advice and bringing the kinks back together. <laughs> and, I, and I thought in that moment, that's the, this is a story I will tell a lot, but also... That's how great the big issue is because it can make these kind of glorious bits of happenstance a reality. And, you know, it, they, it worked. And, and we, we ran that piece and Ray, Ray and Dave both did their interviews. And one of my journalists drove around with Mark Hamill in the Star Wars car for two or three days going to various parts of London to conduct the interviews, which we ran over a period of time and it was it was just great really and, and subsequently mark hamill has been a great supporter of the big issue he's a really good good man so these kind of things they play well they sell well they, they illustrate <clears throat> the strength of brand and they also they, they show another thing that i i do say to young journalists uh, just ask do not be scared to ask do not think oh they'll never do it or that will never happen how do you know you haven't asked? Just go and ask. Very, very wise advice. Um, now, this year um, has clearly been a massive challenge for you and your vendors with COVID and certainly in the first lockdown, uh, deserted streets. Um, how did you adapt to that and what have you done to support your vendor network? Well, uh, yeah, that that was a hell of a change. The um... That first lockdown came, when it came, we, as I'm sure a lot of publishers were, we, we suspected that something was about to change. And we just didn't know what exactly. Um, and I, I had been uh, at the vets on the Friday before lockdown. My dog had a bad leg. And so I'd finished up work early. And I'd gone to the vet. And I was driving back from the vet. And John Burge rang me. And it doesn't normally ring on on press day and he rang and he said look you've got to get in touch with the printer and pull the the print job and i thought is he all right what's he talking about and he said look we've just been tipped off by the government lockdown's coming next week we've got to take all vendors off the street we've got to act quickly and do this they're at risk we cannot allow our our vendors to come under any other risk and i thought is this it is this is this now the the end because the big issue has been going for all these years based on a street sale model. We sell to the vendors, our vendors go out and sell to the public, and that's it. So we could open the doors on any given Monday, and if vendors don't come through, we don't sell the magazine, and you know, we don't last that much longer. And here we were faced with this, <coughs> excuse me, existential crisis thing, and what the hell are we gonna do? How can we turn this thing around? We go from 78,000 sales a week to zero. No money for us, no money for vendors. And over that weekend, we resolved to make it work. We we changed everything, utterly everything, radically, completely. We we decided that we were going to, for that period of time, and initially we thought it was three months, we would become a subscription magazine. At that point, we didn't really have subscribers. We'd never, because we didn't want to get too in the way of, of vendors, so we'd focus on the street. So within, I would say, 30 days, 30 to 40 days, we went from zero to 10,000 subscribers. This is without the normal spend that titles have to build their subscription base. We just did it through work, force of will, contacting every single person. You know, a lot of people say to me, Paul, I, I love the big issue. If I can do anything to help, let me know. They got a call. 
like uh, several calls, and a lot of them really were amazing. And stood up, and I, uh, you know, to again, Chris Pagan, um, Ricky Ross from Deacon Blue, uh, just so many people made little videos and carried subscription. That worked. We went into shops for the first time. We started selling in retail. Um, we built an app so we could sell a digital edition properly for the first time. <clears throat> we did all of this and other fundraising elements in order to get money in to get money out to vendors. Now, we cut our we cut our costs massively. No freelance budget. That had gone. People working from home, so there wasn't that normal creative hubbub that allows you to move things from things that don't quite work to things that really work. Having to change the content of the magazine and online to reflect the fact that everything had shut down, getting different voices in. We, we had to do so much while we were still fighting for our lives that it was just a remarkable concerted effort by everybody. And one of the really remarkable things is that through that period, not only did we manage to survive, and again, thanks to such goodwill of, of both readers and supporters. We give out. We were able to give out around six hundred thousand pounds in money, uh, or supermarket vouchers, or or energy cards, or whatever it was that vendors needed to vendors across Britain. Otherwise, they would have been zero. So that is incredibly proud. And it, I remember getting very emotional. People when they got their first subscription copies um, started tweeting pictures of them. Uh, and I just broke down and cried when I saw them on Twitter, first of all. And I thought, we're doing it. We're getting there. You put so much work and you put so much energy into these things. And suddenly you see these, you know, signs of life. <clears throat> and I thought, we're going to do it. We're going to get through in the vendors. We're going to get through for them. And the big issue has been proudly all about a hand up, not a hand out for so long that we had to become a hand out organization. And we also had to reach our own hand out, you know. We had to ask people to give to us. And now we're back into it <laughs> to a degree, yeah. uh, which is it's a, that's, it's a hard one to take because, as you know, and as many of the listeners to this podcast will know, Christmas is such a key time for publishers, so key. Sales, advertising, potential to really ramp up subscriptions through Christmas gifts and so forth. <clears throat> and so here we are. Uh, looking at trying to cope with the strange situation in Wales that had their big fire break. It's difficulty in Scotland because people aren't out as much as they were. And then a full lockdown in England. So we're having to just go again, go hard again to try and build up those subs again. Because so many of them were three months. We, <clears throat> you know, we, we're, we're going out again to say we need you back again and we're doing it slightly differently and maybe a little better than we did. And then hoping that we can get back on the streets for the big, big month of December because we need to we need to be there for vendors who, when the winter hits, have nothing, have nothing. Um, and we need to be there post December when things are lean in in the spring. So the next number of weeks, I will not try and sugarcoat it, are going to be really, really hard, and it's a tough time, and it and it it takes it out of you. But then I I do. <laughs> When I think that, then I just think, well, you're not out selling it, so dry your eyes and get on that. So as you say, the print magazine is at the core of what you do. Um, but I know that you've recently expanded your digital team and launched a new app. I don't know how that's played into the whole subscriptions um, side of things, but can yeah. you tell us a bit more about that and the thinking behind that? Certainly, happily. We um, we realised, well, I, I had realised for a time that we we weren't doing enough good work online and we were able to get away with not doing enough good work by saying well we are a street based magazine we make our money in street sales but when that dries up then you think we need to be ready for the next time that we're going to build a big enough part of the um, publishing uh, output that we can start to look at different means to, uh, of revenue and so what that meant is that we had to have a very big strategic look at what digital was for, who it was for, who we were reaching. <clears throat> That's both content, how we're delivering the content, whether how we're pushing it out through social or how we're doing it on the app. 
uh, and also w- w- what means we're using to generate content. Not we, We've been slow, um, unlike other publishers, at getting good video and good audio and so forth. But now we're we're catching up. So Alistair Reed has come in as our editor. He's a really, really good, focused journalist. He's um, he's sorting the team out. We are we are building. We've got a certain level of of um, uniques that we want to bring in every every month. We want to grow. <clears throat> We've got very big targets over the next year to grow those people in, and that. At the minute, there's, that's for two reasons. One, it's because we want more people in. We want to be able to explain what it is the big issue is doing. We want to be able to use the um, experience and expertise that we've grown through our staff over the years that we haven't always been really smart at pushing out on digital. We want to do that. And also, we want to be able to use that increased volume of numbers to shift more copies of the magazine and we're working out more sophisticated ways of getting the money to vendors through those sales. So we've had to we've had to adapt really properly, and we've had to make sure it's not just for the sake of it. You know, there's real real targets, particular deliverables. It's and again, it's not easy because we don't have a lot of investment money. We've gone through a, a terrible crisis, so we're just having to be smart. The Big Issue is a very lean organisation. Um, as you might imagine, we can't be seen to be <laughs> throwing yeah. money around. Yeah. And even, even if we had it, which the Big Issue really doesn't have, we, we wouldn't throw it around. But we're, we're trying to find the best ways to grow readership, to grow paper sales through readership digitally, which we, we know that it won't necessarily be the same people, but it, hopefully it will direct some people. And also from my perspective, just to show that we are a, 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 a publication, whether digital or, or paper, that still has something to say, something important to bring to Britain after 30 years. That's that's really important. So where next for the big issue? What's in the pipeline? I mean, I, I know that's a tricky question because you have been firefighting this year, but what what have you got coming up? Well, look, one, one thing that... I, 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 I hope you allow me to to say is that I I call on all listeners to this wonderful podcast or this wonderful title to do what they can to support the big issue through winter. If you can if you can um, subscribe for any period, whether it's three six months a year, subscribe. Whether you just want to make a donation, donate. Whether you want to make a one off purchase of a magazine with a cat on the cover through the big issue shop. Please do it because we need we need to keep that coming in so we're we're around. Now I am confident we will be around. We just need people. And when we are around come next year when hopefully <coughs> excuse me, this vaccine hits, there's a few things. We there's a couple of projects that I I, I don't want to go into, but that involve work beyond and opportunities for work for people beyond uh, the magazine, but with the big issue brand, there was a launch. One of them, the uh, share bike, an electronic bike um, uh, brand that we hope to roll out in cities across Britain. Hire bikes, the way you see, you're familiar with hire bikes, and and this is an electronic yeah, version yeah. of this. So that that's one thing. That's not the only thing that's related to work. <clears throat> the big issue. The big issue we we also I will start looking at, at more books, and particularly as we move into our thirtieth anniversary next September and through October. Um, and we also th- th- there are different parts of the company that are doing different things. So, for instance, big issue invest, which is the um, social investment wing of the big issue, and I, I I should reassure people it doesn't use money generated by big issue sales. It's it's wholly uh, um, sitting on its own and it takes money from organizations or high net worth individuals or, or um, um, CSR who want to invest in social good and it helps them place that in particular organizations that can help those organizations and deliver return. It will be looking to expand next year as well and also we've got a thing called the Big Exchange which is about um, savings really. It's an ISA 
it's a, where you can direct your savings for again social good. So rather than think your money is doing something bad with particular organisations, you can say I want this percentage to be invested in here, or this percentage in um, environmental issues, so that there's there's a positive impact from that. So that again, it's about growth beyond the actual title and, and it's making sure that the brand which as you said at the outset has got real um identification and i and i think a a goodwill around it that we can use that to carry on doing good beyond the the magazine and beyond the output of uh, the website and can i just ask you know what can you quantify the impact that the magazine has on the life of your vendors? During lockdown, we we kept as much as possible kept in contact with vendors because every week in the magazine we run a, a piece called My Pitch, and we it's a very simple piece, a very simple device using the location of where a vendor is, which is a way of telling people they're there. We tell their story how they got to be there, what brought them to um, become a big issue vendor and what their hopes are next. And what we find is there's a recurring thread through that and it's how the big issue, either in that moment or a little before, has lifted them from something really, really terrible. It has offered hope and opportunity and as well as income, which we all need. It's a link to people who they may have been remote from. They might not have stepped outdoors or they may have been sleeping rough and now they're, they're inside. And the big issue is <clears throat> it's something slightly different maybe to all of them, but the main thing that it is is a, this vehicle of hope. Now, translating that, um, we noticed that also when during lockdown that because vendors couldn't connect with the public, they felt more and more remote again so we we understand that one of the really really important things and it's it's kind of it's intangible but you know that it is almost within touching distance is that sense of being in the world and being a part of the world and i think that's what the big issue gives to our vendors um we we are going to we are doing funnily enough some impact studies into much more tangible um results but i think you need you need to remember that nobody sets out in their life nobody's goal is to become a big issue vendor but big issue vendors have also incredible hinterlands and stories and we want to not have people look on big issue vendors as some other but just as people just like you and me who through circumstances led them to sell the magazine now for some it might be enough that they carry on selling the magazine because that, in and of itself, that is their job, and that that is the job that's taken them from a terrible place to here, and they're within a community, and they're happy doing that. For others, it's their platform to jump off and go somewhere else. <clears throat> but for all, I think the big issue is hope. And finally, a question we ask all our guests: outside of work, what do you do to relax? Well, um, I, I've been thinking about this because. The, the the first thing I should say is that even even while you do, the the job stays with you, and I and I know that that sounds ridiculous, but but it is the truth. No matter what you're doing, um, where you try and go and try and shut down for a bit, there's always a part of you, you know, the the main gas burner may be turned down, but the pilot light is still there. That you're thinking about it, the job's just there. Having said that, it's you know once you learn to accept that, and once you know that that is the nature of it. It's okay, and so you 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 set in different mechanisms that help you at different times during different days. So, for instance, I um, my dog has become <laughs> my faithful true companion during lockdown. Um, I, I liked walking him before and having him around, but now because we work mostly at home, he's there all the time, and I walk him. And so I, he is. It, it's a useful thing to do. I like being outside anyway, and and having a dog as a an excuse to go for long walks is really, really helpful. Um, that noise that you can hear, incidentally, is him under my desk. 
he's got a, he's got a cone on his head because he ended up bracing his leg. So that's Aww. if you can hear a strange kind of <laughs> rubbing sound. That's what, that's what it is. Um, okay. I, um, I also uh, I listen to a lot of music. Music is a, a constant, um, both during work and, and at different times. And whether that be, I, I like. Um, I like Shabaka Hutchings, the, the jazz saxophonist. I like listening to whatever it is he's doing. But then equally, I still love Oasis. You know, who doesn't? You should. Everybody should. Um, there, there's not a day that goes by them. Probably listen to them at some point. Equally, there's not a day I don't listen to Miles Davis, uh, Nick Cave, Leonard Cohen, Aretha. I mean, come on. A woman can make everything <laughs> better. And, and and then that'll take you into something around global soul. There's so much. but at different times, whether it's modern 20th century sacred minimalism with Errol Pert or back to back to Oasis, <laughs> there's always a moment when you think, okay, here I can step outside and, and allow music. And also, um, it, my I like spending time with my family. My kids are now getting a bit older. My um, my they're they're both in their teens, they're late teens, so they're they're good to hang around with. Um, they're good fun. They're smart, and because of lockdown, I guess they're they're around more. And thankfully, they have not become difficult. They're 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 really good. Uh, and my wife also, she works in the business. She's a journalist, so she understands what what it's like and and the, the pressures that come with it. So she is somebody who is, you know, just immeasurably helpful. And and not just outside, but within work. I'd, I'd say. Pretty much any good idea I have probably starts with her, and I just rip it off. Um, I, I try and exercise a bit now. I, I never, I, when I was much younger, I did. I, I like running and playing football. Um, but then I guess when I get into business, especially when I started the NME, physical exercise wasn't necessarily top priority. Um, but uh, I think there's a small fat Irish farmer inside of me dying to break out, so I have to find ways to make sure he's contained. So I I like to box. I I go boxing. Um, nothing particularly too strenuous. Just a little um, a little pad work, some bags, but a light sparring just to make sure that I don't turn into that fat Irish farmer. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I, what else? I, I quite like to drive as well, which again is not terribly easy during lockdown because you're thinking, "Am I? Should I be going here? Should I not be going here?" And I just like to go, get out in the car, and and listen to music and and drive, um, particularly at night around Glasgow because Glasgow is such a beautiful city, um, and in the rain, and it looks so beautiful in the rain, which there is plenty of. Um, and driving around Glasgow in the rain, listening to the Blue Nile is one of life's rich pleasures. And I'd recommend if anybody gets a chance to do it. But I will say that with all of these things, there is that thing just in the back of your head thinking, right, what am I going to do? What's what's happening with this person? What's this cover going to be? How are we going to get this content in? Where are we going online? How are we going to sell? You know, it's still, it's, it's a little chirp, but you have to accept that and get on with it. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that insight into your your rich uh, inner, outer life. Um, <laughs> Paul, M- Paul M- McNamee, thank you very much for being our guest on the In Publishing podcast. Not at all. Thank you. A big thank you again to Acorn Web Offset for sponsoring this podcast. If you're looking for a new magazine printer, then check out their website at acornweb.co.uk or contact Matt Carey on 07714 299 105 or by email at matthew.carry at acornweb.co.uk. Thanks to Paul for being our guest this week. You can find out more about The Big Issue and how you can support it at bigissue.org.uk. You can visit our website at inpublishing.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and please join me next week on the In Publishing Podcast.